all right so uh, please note that yesterday uh, there was another video uploaded on order on the selection of the stop okay that topic has been covered many times but since it's a very important topic for you to understand logically how stops are uh, decided in technical trading using a very simple definition of the trend so everybody should have been should have already been subscribed to the channel and uh, click the notification bell so that I, I could upload a video at any point of time I'm not going to separately inform you by whatsapp or whatever right so you should already be subscribed to the channel with the notification uh, and and you know set up for notification so whenever I upload a video you should be able to get uh, wind of that is that clear so that will not be you have to watch that video and uh, you know understand that for yourself okay so that is treated as an extension of yesterday's class all right make sure you understand it it's been discussed before but it's a very important point so it's important uh, and it'll give you a very uh, it covers a very important foundation of uh, technical trading that is uh, how to set the stop and as I said this, uh, the risk management aspect of it is the most important thing okay so uh, as I said so technical trading is very simple okay the way I've taught you to approach it because we have this problem with the project right now because we don't have time to cover the entire uh, body of fundamental analysis okay so there are two broad approaches that you can take you guys have heard these terms fundamentals and technicals have I covered it with you guys before that fundamental analysis we normally look at earnings and GDP and inflation we haven't covered it okay so there are these two broad approaches okay uh, we are coming to that okay we will come to that when we look at the decision problems but the point is basically what you're doing now okay I won't even cover fundamentals now except for telling you except to tell you that uh, the coverage of fundamentals will take a lot of time okay so it's a very vast area and it'll take a lot of time so and because we have this time pressure of the project so I want to just quickly give you some basic skills with which you can implement the project without feeling completely lost okay so that's why for the purposes of this project okay as far as what I'm teaching you is concerned okay we are just going to look at uh, I'm just going to initially equip you only with the toolkit of technical analysis which actually is a very simple approach so I'm teaching you a very simple way to approach the market at the same time it's quite a powerful method okay uh, it's a powerful method and if you can learn to implement it properly it, it's a simple and powerful method okay and you can easily implement it uh, even for managing large amounts of money in the real world okay so there's, it's not something to be laughed at just because it seems like very it's a very simple thing okay so in that context obviously what is the most important thing that that second video from yesterday what it deals with is how the what is the logic for selecting the stop okay so understand that video properly and if and as I, and the most important thing in trading whether you trade from a fundamental or technical perspective is risk management okay because the models are all very fallible so the way you're able to manage your risk you understood what risk management is by now okay that when I looked at if you look at if we go back to that example that I've given you where I was buying that TCS stock okay all right so I bought the stock somewhere around here and what is the risk management aspect of it risk management essentially means the way I ensure my risk management program ensures that I don't lose everything on uh, one trade okay so uh, so I basically control the amount of money you lose because one of the big problems with many people have which you guys have also experienced firsthand that you got into a uh, position without uh, pre-planning your risk you haven't thought about what you're going to do this is how most amateur investors invest that they first just go in and buy or sell whatever they want to do okay usually they go from the long side so they go and buy some stuff okay uh, and usually they're operating in equity markets so they go and buy stock but they have no plan for uh, what they're going to do if things go don't don't go according to plan okay if it moves in your favor that's fine you can sit and enjoy the profits okay but you need a plan for that as well but the more important plan is what you're going to do when it goes against you okay so like a lot of you have been saying that the stock market has been dropping lately and you're buying stocks and facing losses right so this is the uh, this is the heart of what risk management is all about what do you do when you uh, you know when you start losing money on your positions okay so what I did here if you saw when I decided to buy TCS okay the uh, as, you know as Aurora was asking why did you decide to buy that's a simple question I just assume that simple answer to that question is I assume that this trend is still in continuing but the most important thing I did was 
that uh, as soon as I bought it here, I also placed a stop over here. Okay, which means that on per share, on a per share basis, let's say I bought it around 2100, okay, roughly, and this is around uh, 2028. Okay, so that means I can only lose about 80, okay, 72, uh, 72 uh, rupees per share, okay, on this position. So now you see the beauty of this. If you can trade in this manner, always this is the golden rule of, uh, of, of trading, okay, that you must pre plan your risk. If you do this, it may seem like you're following a very simple method, but it's a very powerful method and uh, the market can never really, uh, you know, do much damage to you because you're always, uh, you know, under control, you know, your losses are always within budget. Okay. So you have a budgeted risk capital at the beginning of the period and you carve it up. We will discuss the details of that. But the idea I think should be clear to everybody that I'm not out of control here because I can control my exit. I control my entry, I control my exit and thereby I control my maximum loss. You can see that here unless there is a massive amount of, uh, you know, market turmoil and what I'm trying to sell at 20, 2028, it actually gets sold only at 1100, uh, 1900 or something, which is not going to happen in, in a liquid market. Okay. So I will be out reasonably around 2028. Okay. At, the, at around this level, whatever this low is. Okay. So. So you can see clearly that I have therefore limited my loss on this trade to uh, my worst case on this trade is 72 rupees per share. Is that clear? So you, you should be able to appreciate the power of that kind of approach. Okay. That you are just making bets. And even if you assume that your bets are just 50 50. Okay. That your hit trade is only 50 50. Even if you assume that. Okay. So even then uh you can't really so on half your trades as you assume that you'll win and we'll we'll come to how much you make on winning uh, on your winning trades but the point is that you have limited the loss on your losing trades this is clear so this is a very powerful and a absolutely essential approach to trading in fact many professional managers also don't do this that's why they end up losing large amounts of money okay so this actually what i'm teaching you it seems like very simple it's a very simple thing because i'm just telling you to look at this thing as if you're surfing waves okay it seems like you're not applying any sophisticated mathematical model or anything but it's a very sophisticated approach simply because you're limiting the loss on each trade okay and on the other 50 percent roughly let's say assume on your winning trades okay you can make whatever money you can make okay there are ways to manage that as well so is this point clear to everybody so understand the logic behind how the stops are set okay it's a very powerful uh, method and most important element of this of course as i said is the heart of all kinds of uh, trading not just trading to manage a risk uh, active risk book like what your asset manager like a speculative book okay uh, but even for a corporate treasury even for a corporate treasury which is hedging its risk like air india is exposed to oil prices okay so if oil prices go up is it good for air india or bad for air india bad for air india okay because one of the things you'll do a risk management case in your second uh, course okay uh, the the general thumb rule all over the world okay is that about 50 percent of the operating cost of any airline is fuel costs okay and the jet fuel costs are very close jet fuel prices are very closely uh, linked to crude oil prices okay the jet fuel is actually kerosene so it is a derivative of crude oil it comes from processing of crude oil but the prices are very closely linked so if you have a dramatic rise in crude oil prices it's very unlikely that jet fuel prices will also not go up a hell of a lot okay so therefore one major risk for many airlines is oil prices okay so when even when air india is managing its risk even there this concept of the stop loss okay it has to be applied in a slightly different way even this concept of risk management still applies even there okay so it applies in all kinds of finance roles that you will face okay so it's very important to understand this but unfortunately in the traditional approach to teaching finance this kind of thing is not emphasized but in the real world this is the key to survival okay the key to survival in the real world is this business of risk management so one of the great traders uh, system traders called, the guy called ed sakota he was asked about um, he was asked about the golden rules of trading you can uh, look up this book there's a book called market wizards you'll find the pdf i'm sure on the on the internet there's a famous book called the market wizards by jack schwager and he interviews one guy called ed sakota who's one of the great system traders so he was asked about the three golden rules of trading so his answer was cut losses cut losses then cut losses okay so this is the heart of survival in this business okay because if you can manage see basically the idea is that if you can manage to limit the losses on your losing trades 
okay eventually you'll have some winning trades and you can maximize your profits on those trades okay and we'll talk about how to do that but the most the most important reason why most people fail or most investors get into all kinds of problems and they lose control over the process okay they lose control over the process because they are not controlling their risk per trade in a highly disciplined manner okay so this is clear so make sure you understand this logic all right okay so we go into uh, we we're just going to continue here with so i put this yesterday we were discussing these um, the last point we were discussing yesterday was basically we looked at market depth and all that and we were looking at spoofing and layering today since we have the benefit of the internet let me show you a nice example of market depth that's like an active market like the euro okay just right click you can do this actually you can get it even for your nse stocks so you might have fun with nse stocks because your project trading period is quite low i mean it's quite short okay so in that case therefore it kind of puts you into a short term trading framework okay uh, in some ways okay so you can even try this with your nse stocks but i want to show you some more actively traded uh, market so let's just right click on the euro okay so when you right click i they've already got book trader because i've used book trader before but let me just go through the more general route go to trading to uh, trading tools then you go to book trader okay now here you can see again the euro order book yesterday we discussed the euro order book i mean uh, we discussed order books so i'm now giving you a very visual pitch picture of the order book okay can you see the stuff here so you can see here basically this is your top of the book here okay this 34 34 half this kind of uh, this is your bid ask you can show, see that okay and uh, 34 half it's it's moving so fast you can actually i can't even call it out you can see what's happening here it's the same concept here you can see all the bids lined up on one side is yesterday i had just done them in two columns on the board okay but this is basically almost in one column because the prices are all in one column okay so on the left side you see here you see the bid sizes and that this is what i was showing you yesterday okay there's a price and there's a size so somebody is bidding for 14 million at 1134 okay somebody is now bidding for 13 million not this is may not be somebody but this is the aggregate of all the orders so you get the option of basically under this 12 million or 13 million on the bid side now there could be 10 uh, people putting this uh, you know basically there could be 10 people bidding at 1134 but the broker is showing you the 1134 because you can hit that 1134 for 12 million there's a total of 12 million of bids over there all right is this clear to everybody same thing now you're seeing a live example you can play with your nse stocks also and see the market depth and this is the way you get into what garvit was talking about yesterday that you can look at this and try to assess what is the uh, whether the pressure the short term pressure in the market is to the upside or to the downside are you following you try to see okay then are there more orders on the buy on the sell side or are there more orders on the buy side are there more offers or the more uh, bids okay so from that if you see obviously if you see more bids that means the short term market is strong or weak the short term market is more inclined to be strong right because there are more bids you see higher volume of bids okay so uh, and and on the other of course the other side the the reverse conclusion would uh, follow okay so and from here you try to uh, basically play around in the short term okay and uh, try to adjust your prices if you're a market maker etc okay so this is the idea and then we talked about spoofing and layering yesterday okay so that article actually doesn't define layering very well uh, it doesn't define it properly is because people are not very careful in the way they use the language but spoofing essentially all that it means is see now the prices are here okay and let's assume that the, there's not that much difference here so suppose here instead of putting 311 million i put a 100 billion sell order suppose actually i want to buy okay uh we just this is already explained in the article i just briefly explain it proofing what we are doing is here the this is where the market is okay this is where the market is but what i want to do is i want to actually i want to buy but i want to deceive people i want to scare the market and push the price down okay so what i'll do is i'll put like a 100 billion sell order here okay maybe 100 billion sell order here okay very close to the market so when people see that people get scared they think that oh my god there are so many sell orders okay uh then what they do is those who want to sell those who are inclined to sell 
okay or the, those who need to sell they see those big sell orders and they get uh, nervous and they quickly sell okay so that pushes the price down and then what i do is then when when the price goes down say to 11.32 or some 11.32 so at, at this level okay because the people who are willing to who are inclined to sell they see those big offer sizes and they get scared and then they start selling and they pushes the price down and then i put in a bid at 11.32 and i buy let's say a much smaller amount that i wanted to buy and then as soon as i buy this stuff or just before that i cancel all my sell orders are you following yes. okay so this is what spoofing is okay so i cancel all my sell orders so yeah what is the order we take to yeah so very good point so this is why if you read that article so then the question that will arise is that this is where the policy debate comes in again okay that uh, the question is so if you see that it talks about that guy narendra sarao i told you about there's a guy who was spoofing the s&p 500 yes. uh, futures contracts okay so he was uh, so you understood what spoofing is yes. and layering is nothing but spoofing at many levels okay so layering is just spoofing at multiple levels he's not explained it very well in the article okay but that's what it is basically he, he says it but then he again uh, um, uh, writes some confusing sentences but so this guy Narendra Sarao when he was uh, he's been charged by the DOJ because the new rules in the US now spoofing is a crime okay so uh, now the question is basically if you see that writer in that particular article okay he actually says if you see this article so he actually gives an opinion so the question of course can arise because this is a fairly new rule in the US okay uh, which makes spoofing a crime so he's actually talking about this is that uh, Indian origin trader okay so this question is should this be illegal okay so this is a policy question you should be able to engage in a debate which is what actually uh, sakshi is hinting at the question that she's asking what if some uh, that order gets executed what sakshi is saying is i put in a lot of uh, uh, offers i put in a lot of offers at with very high volumes okay just above the market okay thinking that i'll scare the market but what she's saying is what if before you can carry out your devious scheme some guy comes and buys takes all your offers because you're offered to sell okay so somebody can come in and easily buy your stuff because you have put in those offers okay suddenly because the markets can move very dramatically okay there's no guarantee that it will necessarily move in a steady uh, manner okay markets can move very dramatically okay so therefore what is the so what she's asking is what and that's a real risk okay so if you go if you see that that observation actually goes to the heart of this policy debate that should this be like you should understand this debate also okay that should this question now everybody understands what spoofing is is everyone clear about that yes. okay so we and uh, shivam what are you doing here so let's move should should be somewhere else so that she cannot communicate with him Sorry. come and sit next to come and sit next to tarun so it's easier for her to move no she's on the outside let her move here okay uh now uh one sec so what, what was i saying yeah so everyone understands you need to understand to understand this debate you need to understand this properly so everyone knows what spoofing is now it's essentially you're placing an order with, to basically uh, uh scare other traders in the market and cause some kind of price movement but you have no intention of executing those orders okay so the question now is as this guy narendra sarao is being prosecuted for spoofing which is now a crime but the question the policy debate can always arise should this be a crime in the first place okay is this a problem for the marketplace all right so the what this guy if you see this writer of this cnbc article okay he's actually saying that it should not be a crime because of what sakshi has pointed out that there is always a risk that some just when you put up these big offers which you have no intention of executing somebody can immediately lift those offers because if if uh, you know markets can move very dramatically you don't know what who can come into the market at what point of time okay so this is where so i would also agree with the cnbc article writer's view that this should not be illegal because you are taking a risk when you do this you are taking a risk especially if the market is actually a free and unregulated market so remember what happens is the general principle which you should try and understand which is something that uh, even gulati was talking about yesterday that uh, i mean he was taking off on what uh, garvit was saying that 
how can you influence the market in a, a you know way and he was actually hinting that that would be unethical can you can influence the market by putting prices etc okay by sh uh, or by buying stuff he was actually talking about not actual he was not talking about spoofing but he was talking about actually buying he was actually saying that if you can buy large amounts and then you can push up the price okay so that's what he was talking about okay but even that whether it's spoofing or even what uh, Gulati was talking about actually buying and trying to push up the market or actually selling and trying to push down the market okay all these things are actually risky there's no guaranteed profit because you in a in a large and open market like the euro I mean the foreign exchange markets are the most unregulated markets in the world okay there's about uh, the average daily volume does anybody have any idea what is the average daily volume in the foreign exchange markets so it's 5.1 trillion dollars per day okay at its at its peak about four five years ago it was 5.3 trillion dollars per day so e every day you have 5.3 trillion dollars of uh, activity in the foreign exchange market and about nine about only about about uh, 95 more than 95 percent of that is speculative activity okay which is something that need not necessarily be done okay it's not that like toyota motor needs to buy some amount of euros to pay their suppliers in europe okay if that's not speculation that's just a hedge okay or just just a transaction uh, for a for a commercial business but this is we are talking about 95 percent of this 5.1 trillion volume is actually speculative but you see the beauty of speculation you see how tight the spreads are in the foreign exchange markets okay this is what speculation does it makes the market very liquid so and in very and so understand this policy issue this is an important thing to understand okay that uh, it should not be i am also uh, this is of course my opinion you can always disagree and obviously the u.s lawmakers have disagreed okay and they have made spoofing illegal okay but the point is that why are people saying that it should not be illegal either spoofing or what gulati is saying trying to manipulate the market by buying large amounts or selling large amounts neither of these should be illegal because when you do these things you are still taking a risk because when the market is free and open and unregulated what happens is that anyone can come in see these foreign exchange markets as you saw yesterday they are moving around the clock from sydney from wellington sydney tokyo hong kong everybody's open at any point of time there's no rule saying that just because new york is trading now that city hong kong night desk can't come and trade in that market okay they can always do that it's a free and open market so in that kind of a market the problem is that if you are trying to manipulate the market you don't really know what the other guys are planning you have no way of knowing who can come in at any point of time right so therefore there's always a risk involved because whenever you try to manipulate the market or like as sakshi was pointing out you try to spoof and you place a huge sell order and immediately bang something happens and somebody takes out uh, takes those offers and then suddenly you're short huge amounts where you had no intention you were actually looking to buy are you following so uh, this kind of argument is very important to be exposed to you don't have to agree with it because in india you'll never hear this kind of argument in india people are always afraid that there's going to be market manipulation but market manipulation is only a risk when the market is closed and restricted in many ways like for instance as you know the reserve bank of india restricts uh, foreign portfolio investors from investing in indian debt securities whether it's government debt or corporate debt there's always some number and the way they manage it is okay if they feel more comfortable we'll raise it from 100 billion to 150 billion or whatever but there is a cap okay in a real free market there's no cap you can come in and trade as many market as many dollars as if somebody is willing to quote you a price you can trade okay so there, this is where, where the risk is you try to manipulate i just come to you where you, when you try to manipulate free markets the risk of manipulation is much less in free and liquid markets because there is no there is less and less restriction on the number of players who can come in so when you are manipulating you don't know what anybody else might do okay so the guy that guy may be bigger than you so he might come in and you know do something which is opposite to your intentions and then you may end up in a loss so therefore there is always a risk involved in any kind of manipulation in a free market is this clear to everybody it's important to understand this okay all these points which we have covered <coughs> spoofing layering which is layering is nothing but spoofing at multiple price levels okay spoofing and also understand the policy debate around spoofing and spoofing and also we can connect that to what Gulati were talk, talking about trying to manipulate the market by buying or selling large volume to do that you're still running a risk because you don't know that the other, i mean you have no way of knowing that some other guy who is bigger than you will come and hit on the other side and then you'll get into problems okay so in a free market 
uh, pretty much anything goes because there is competition and there's always risk right okay so it's kind of similar to if you follow tennis there was a thing called a uh, few months uh, maybe about a year back there was a uh, Federer had started a new technique where on the se second serve he used to come in very he used to sort of come very close to the net that was called like a sneak attack by Roger it was, the name was SABR Sabre right so people are saying that Federer is behaving unethically by charging on the second serve okay but actually he's not behaving unethically because he's taking a risk if he's charging forward on the second serve the other guy can actually serve in a manner that you know uh, makes it more difficult for him so he's not he's actually taking a risk so if he's taking a risk then it's not really unethical because you know it's an open it's it's, it's open it's an open game basically right so a similar idea actually okay so uh, yeah now let's go to Saloni's question yeah do we have a mic Yes. Let's give her the mic. Yeah. Mic is not working. The mic. <coughs> what happened? Here they haven't switched it on here. Well, it seems to be on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sir, it won't be fair to other people like if one person uh, starts cooking and then other also start doing that and then. And like it's a uh, both, uh, two or three people start swooping at the same time, and it won't be fair to the other people. How will they get to know that this thing is going on? They might get trapped. See, the the two levels uh, we can answer that on the face of it, it seems that yeah, it's unfair. But understand that these things. See how quickly these things are changing. Do you notice when you're looking at the order book? Do you notice how quickly the levels are and the amounts are changing? Can you see that? And this is not even an active time, okay? If you go into your notes and if you look at um, the uh, market hours or under market hours, I'm pretty sure London has not yet opened, okay? Uh, so the busiest time, if you look at, we are looking at the foreign exchange market, okay? So you see how rapidly the amounts are changing and the prices are also changing and the price is moving around. There's no way to tell which way it'll go okay so now it's pretty quiet still okay but prices are changing. so the point is that whoever is showing this price like this 1 million at 136 uh, half okay now he is not bound by this price he's always free to change the price okay as long as a, he, but if somebody immediately hits what what uh, sakshi is pointing at if somebody has already taken the price is it, somebody has already taken the offer then he can't back out okay but as long as he's offering and remember in contract law there's also a concept of revocation of offer okay yeah. i can give you an offer you can buy this land okay <coughs> at this price okay but as long as you haven't as nobody's hit my offer nobody has taken my offer i can always withdraw the offer okay i can say this offer to sell this land at this price is now revoked okay so in contract law there's already the concept of revocation of offer before acceptance obviously you can't revoke the offer after acceptance right if the other guy has accepted your offer then you're tired you're bound by it but you can't you can always revoke it before the acceptance has happened so therefore if you see here these guys when they are posting offers every investor should have the freedom to change their mind okay maybe you put this 3 million sell order here but maybe some news comes out okay and then that causes you to change your mind to sell you you should have the freedom to revoke your offer okay so this is consistent with the contract law principle of revocation of offers obviously subject to the rule that you can't revoke an offer which has already been accepted okay this is clear so does that partly answer your question and so and the other let me also complete uh, give you another element of it that in the sense that when I'm looking at these prices okay if I'm looking at these uh, prices from various market makers okay and I'm a price taker I already know that there's nothing guaranteed about this see when I'm a market participant I already know that this 375 at 37 half 2 million this is just an indication at this point of time until I hit until I actually trade on it okay the guy can change his prices same thing that if I'm a player in the market I know that all offers are subject to revocation before acceptance this is nothing but that so as a player it's not that I have some immense faith that this price will be held for so long okay unless somebody says sometimes people say 
sometimes people give prices but th that those are actually unusual situations sometimes when people are quoting for corporates okay this is we are talking about the interbank market okay this is the professionals market but sometimes when you are quoting for corporate customers okay say let's say standard chartered bank treasury is quoting a price to say mahindra and mahindra for some commercial transaction okay maybe they want to send some royalty payment or something so the mahindra treasury might say can you hold that price for uh, 15 minutes okay so in that case sanchart might take a call on the customer relationship and all that even though there's some market price risk for them they'll say okay fine we will hold this price for 15 minutes in which case they can they can strike and accept that price at any time in the next 15 minutes okay but that's an unusual situation normally in the market that does not happen so you always understand that every so you have to go back to that basic contract law principle all offers are uh, subject to revocation before acceptance so it's consistent with that so it's not really unfair and every participant should know that these are not firm until i uh, anybody can change these offers and bids at any point of time is this clear is everyone clear okay you don't have to agree with the, what i'm saying or what the cnbc article writer is saying but you should understand the argument that's the point right because in india you'll never see these kind of arguments india is always any hint of any problem let's regulate okay so i mean the, the more regulation the better it is and the population is also inclined you know uh, you know things like that if you see population is also inherently socialistic so they always think that more government control of everything is always better so anyway so we have covered some important concepts we are actually just recapping so as i said london is not yet open okay so we are now in a halfway house tokyo and sydney have closed okay but of course singapore hong kong zurich frankfurt these guys are open frankfurt and all are one hour behind london so if london is going to open in 35 which means frankfurt and zurich are all open already so there is still liquidity in the market that's why you see that uh the foreign exchange market if you look at the prices you see how tight the prices are 37 37.1 okay fifth decimal all right so you can see how tight the prices are so that's because this market is uh, pretty much pretty liquid from uh, monday to friday monday opening in wellington to friday closing in new york there's no uh, no real pause in this market okay so what is our next topic at any point if you don't follow anything you have to so spoofing layering that topic has been covered right okay order books top of the book market depth all right so this is your market depth here you are seeing uh, here sorry here you see here you see the market depth right see here you can see all this if you want to go all the way back but in general you want to stay close to where the market is right this is where the market is right are you following this is a display of the full market depth all right so the next topic is okay so you should also learn this term high frequency trading in this context okay because this is the context in which the spoofing and layering debate really comes up a lot okay so hft the the term is hft which stands for high frequency trading which is nothing but and these are your notes so i'll just write it here okay not going to look pretty but we'll just make sure the information is just basically um high frequency trading is just nothing but high um in and out turnover in and out you understand you buy and sell the same amount okay that is just what i mean by uh, this loose expression in and out turnover there is actually a burger chain in the us called in and out burger okay so high in and out turnover in very short periods of time okay so essentially very short period of, which basically implies um so this is basically what you would call a high volume you heard these terms high volume low margin business you heard you are familiar with these expressions okay so high volume low margin uh, business kind of um, philosophy okay all right this is the idea that you are playing for you are not playing for if you looked at what i was doing there as a directional speculator so in many ways market making is a high volume low margin business 
okay market making is expected to be a high volume low margin business because on, you're not playing for big moves in the market as a market maker if you're in a reasonably competitive market prices will be pretty tight okay uh, if you want to see some stable prices you would look at the ones which are already closed I don't know why they're not showing the bids and offers on these uh, the US stocks but anyway so you can see that in a market if you're looking at market making in Indian stocks okay pretty tight margins okay in the liquid stocks okay so you're as a market maker because you're looking to quickly you're ideally looking for 50% of the uh, uh, transactions to be on the bid side and 50% on the offer side and in a liquid market bids and offers the bid offer spread will be pretty tight okay so your per trade margin is quite low okay but you hope to make money by doing high volume a very high volume of trading okay so market making if you want to use these stereotypes of a high volume low margin business okay uh, this kind of a stereotype a market making business is that kind of business it's meant to be a high volume low margin business okay so HFT in a way is also like that kind of business okay if you look at this here what was my plan as a directional speculator when I was buying TCS what is my view I was saying that it's at the minimum because this long uptrend is not over it is going to go above 2300 so I'm buying at 2100 but I'm expecting it to go above 2300 and maybe two and a half grand okay so there's going to be a lot of profit per share okay so I'm expecting a lot of profit per share here I don't need to have high volume because my margin in a sense is quite high for each transaction okay so per share profit projection is quite high so here I don't have to do it in high volumes are you following okay so you can distinguish this in a way the directional speculation business which need not be a high volume business because the per, uh, the margin in a way is quite high the margin is used within uh, air quotes okay so you get the idea right so essentially what is high frequency trading this is what it is if you look at this business if you look at this order book this you gives you a very good idea of what high frequency trading is okay these guys are trading in very large volumes okay and they are not uh, even if they are not market makers okay so high frequency trading could be a both a speculator directional speculator or a um, or a market maker okay but this is a very specific type of directional speculator who is looking to make very uh, small profits on very large positions is this clear that's what high frequency trading is so it basically you are not even looking to hold a position for uh, in high frequency trading like five minutes is like a life lifetime okay so five minutes is like a lifetime so these guys are looking to get our positions within like 30 40 seconds okay that fast are you following yes. so huge volumes and try to quickly get in and out with very very small profits like maybe like half a cent okay half a cent of you know maybe like uh, 25 uh, you know uh, like less than half a cent and that kind of small margin this is clear to you is everyone clear about this because prices are moving around quite sharp uh, quite rapidly and in deep and liquid markets you can move large volumes so you try to so this is all that I just want you to be familiar with this term called high frequency trading because it is thrown around a lot okay so uh, this is referred to as HFT okay high frequency trading and so here speed becomes very important okay so we, we should write down one more element here because you should be aware of this problem that we have in in um, I just introduce one more element to this which is high frequency trading and so now everybody understand what high frequency trading is it's nothing but that means your total transaction volume at the end of the day will be huge okay it will be in billions of dollars because you are just trading in and out in and out in very large volumes multiple times a day that's why it's high frequency is this clear it doesn't have to be the same amount maybe first transaction is 500 million next one is 400 million it doesn't have to be the same amount but large amounts okay it has to be large amounts based on what you assess the market liquidity to be at that point of time but it is basically the idea is very large amounts and you're trading in large volumes every time and that's why you are willing to take even a small two paisa profit per uh, or half a cent profit per transaction is also okay for you because your volumes are very big this is clear okay this is just a strategy yeah 
seen as when we execute the first order and the first question of the market. Yeah. A bulk order. That is high frequency trading. No, no, no. That is just that's just bulk trading. Bulk trading. That need not be connected. <laughs> high frequency trading usually is not done through that kind of an organized system. It is done when the market is uh, live and fluid on and and trading, you know, normally. And then you go in and you decide to trade uh, trade as a high frequency trader because you can always decide to keep on buying, keep on sell, keep on doing. Nobody, there's no uh, restriction on the number of your trades as long as you're willing to put up the margin. So it's not something that would be done as such a uh, because that's an organized process that bulk trading, matching of bulk orders. Yeah, that's not high frequency trading. Okay, that's a different kind of thing. So high frequency trading now everybody understands it's a big word, but this is basically all that it is. It's a high volume, low volume margin business, and you uh, you don't hold positions for very long. You keep on turning over your positions. You know, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, that quickly. Okay, so time is of the essence. Okay, you understand this. Uh, not just time but speed okay do you understand why speed is of the essence here actually we should have come back to this later I'll what I'll do is I'm not I don't want to because I need to cover the essentials for your trading I don't want to get into this topic right now okay I'm just gonna write it here I'll cover it later okay speed is of the essence okay so um, let me just talk about SEBI and the co-location con um, controversy. Okay. So essentially, what happens? We'll discuss this later on at a point of time. But this is more of a policy issue. But you need to understand all these issues. But right now, I'm more concerned with giving you the essentials for your trading project. Okay. So we'll come to this. But the point is that you see that in high frequency trading, speed will become very important because I'm trying to get in and out and you see the prices are changing. Okay, obviously now 6 million, 33 half. If I am not first in line to sell the 6 million, if I need to sell 6 million, somebody else will come in now. She's already gone to 3 million, 1 million. Okay, so basically what's happening is somebody was ahead of me in the queue because you're going to enter the order here. And like you, there are hundreds of investors all over the world who are entering orders, okay, through their systems. So these orders all get, get into a queue. Okay, so you have to be executed, your orders will be executed in, as, as, as on a first come first serve basis in the queue. So if you get late in the queue, then obviously your priority goes down. Okay, so because of this speed becomes very important. And that's why there's this issue of I'll just touch on it briefly, you can listen to it once again, and read up on it a little bit. So essentially, what happens is a lot of high frequency traders want to go for what is called co location, which is basically nothing but co location. You need to have some idea of uh, this client server technology okay so what they're trying to do in co-location is they're trying to locate because they want to get their orders to the exchange server very quickly so they try to locate the servers near the NSE servers that the exchange servers okay so there's actually a case in India where two three trading firms have been fined by SEBI okay and this problem exists in the US also because they try to place their servers very close to the say the NSE servers in the NSE server room itself wherever the NSC servers was uh, were located you understand this client server technology yes. okay so if you are physically close to the server because now we are talking about milliseconds we are not talking about seconds also we are talking about milliseconds okay or even smaller than that okay so therefore you want to get the millisecond advantage over your next over your competitor so if you can be located closer to the NSC server or the exchange server then you your order will be transmitted faster to the server because the queue matters only at the exchange server level are you following okay you get the idea here okay because speed is of the essence because you want to hit the prices before it uh, disappears so this is the idea here that uh, there is this idea so co-location is a term which is basically nothing but co-location means locating your server near the exchange server if I'm a trading firm okay if I'm SMC or another brokerage or interactive brokers I want to locate my uh, my speculative trading team okay which is engaging in high frequency trading I want to locate their server okay close to the uh, the exchange server okay their computer should be located close to the exchange server so that when they transmit orders they go quickly to the top of the queue is this is clear 
Okay, so the physical location of the server actually makes a difference when you're talking about milliseconds. All right. So this is the idea behind co-location. So there's something else you need to learn as we are talking about all these things. These are all connected ideas. When you talk about order books, you try to see how markets operate. Okay, bids, offers, getting hit here and there. Okay, give and take and all that. And then you can see the idea of uh, the of spoofing and layering. And then that brings in the idea of high frequency trading. And then connected idea is also the idea of co-location. Because high frequency traders always want to be located close. Their servers should be close to the exchange servers. They basically want to get to the top of the queue fast. Okay, so this is a basic game. All right. But then many countries don't allow uh, this kind of, they feel that now you're talking about an unfair advantage. Okay, so this is where there's a debate in the US also. <coughs> Sorry. Now you're talking about an unfair advantage because some traders are getting in ahead of the uh, rest of the, they're getting to the front of the queue very quickly. Okay, so there's a big policy debate around this. Okay, about giving some traders an unfair, because those who went to the NSE servers, the Sebi's point was that Sebi find these firms and they find the NSE also. Even the NSE was fined by Sebi. Because their point was you gave these guys an unfair advantage by allowing them to be located next to your servers, which the other guys don't have, the advantage that other guys don't have. Okay, so this is something you have to be aware of. This is part of this entire topic that we are discussing. How markets operate, what are the policy issues that come up, etc. Is this clear? Are you following? Yes. Anybody is lost? Yes, you are following? Okay, good. Okay, so, um, all right. So let's go on quickly to, we are getting a little bit, uh, we are slowing down because every time I cover a topic, I want to cover all the related points because otherwise you have a very stunted uh, vision of that topic, you see. So it's very important to cover all the points, but I'm also pressured by the fact that your project is starting next week. I want to give you the essential toolkit. So if you feel that the coverage is a little bit helter skelter, this is the reason for it, okay? That I am feeling the pressure to give you the essential skill set to do the, um, to do your project. All right, so let's quickly go here. Short version, all right. So, <clears throat> trading on quotes we have done bids and offers but are you are you feeling like you're getting you're learning something are you getting a feel of the whole markets environment how markets operate Chug is not convinced Chug's <laughs> expression is <laughs> are you you're, you're not convinced okay now quickly let's go on to the next thing that you need to learn okay uh, data types okay tracking markets using charts okay let's cover this quickly all right this is our next subtopic even though charts are very simple but we still need to um, let's try and make this more complicated okay all right Okay, so in financial markets, we basically plot two types of charts. Okay, you've heard of these terms time series data, cross sectional data. Yes. Okay, so if I take everybody's temperature in this room and I write down, okay, others 30 or whatever 94, 98 uh, degrees, okay, uh, Hardik's uh, 97 degrees, okay, I write all these uh, figures down, okay. I just took the temperature. This is what? This is what is this? This is cross sectional data or time series data? Is my question clear? I take everybody's temperature in this room with a thermometer and I note down the values. So, names and values of temperature. Then, this is what? Cross. Everybody's not convinced. Shivam? Cross sectional. You're just saying cross. Is everyone convinced? Yes, yes, cross section, but you're not convinced. Okay, so this is cross sectional data. Okay, so we're not going to cover cross sectional data in detail at this point of time. Again, there's a lot of material to be covered under cross sectional data and finance. Okay, there are many types of data, data plots, but again, that's not critical for our NSE uh, trading project. So we're going to push that uh, behind for a while, but you should understand this basic classification between cross-sectional and time series data. So this is cross-sectional. Look at how I've defined cross-sectional data. It's a very technical definition, but if you try to understand it, don't memorize the definition, but try to understand it. Cross-sectional data is, read it. Okay, so if I take 
the other point about cross sectional data is that the order of observations are not relevant if i take everybody's uh, temperature and then i can just write whether i write adarsh's name first or write hardik's names first doesn't make a difference because the it doesn't change the information being provided okay because all you need is the name of every student and their temperature okay this is clear now when you look at time series data you understand why order of observ observations is relevant but first understand cross sectional data okay why it's uh, what is the technical definition of cross sectional data because it's not easy to find them defined in this manner but if you remember the remember if you remember understand the technical definition it cross sectional data is always snapshot okay so essentially the picture that parul took yesterday of the class that's also cross sectional data that at that point of time whoever is present in the class is shown okay uh, but we don't know after 15 minutes who has who was present in the class that we don't know but we know that that point of time these are the people present in the class so that's also cross sectional data okay so a slightly unusual presentation of data but so what are we saying therefore what is the cri cri critical property of cross sectional data at least two variables and one point of time only right so you can have like 50 million variables you can have 50 million people and you can uh, note down their uh, monthly salary okay at any at any point of time because monthly salary can also get revised upwards downwards later on but any point of time monthly salary of 50 million people that's also cross sectional data okay so clear so therefore order of relevance now time series data so i'm actually making it very easy for you so is this time series data or cross sectional data time series data okay because this is the price of tcs common stock over time all right so if you make this uh, like if this right now i've got this as a if you want to make it really simple okay i've made it a line chart okay so now you can see how is this chart derived this is a time series data this is time series data because essentially is the plot of now look at the definition of time series data at least one variable for at least two points of time okay the reason i say normally when we look at time series data it is just one variable okay but i've written one at least one variable because even a comparison is still time series data okay so if i do this for instance and then i compare um, let's say so understand this definition first <coughs> in a way to some extent you have to memorize it but don't memorize it like an idiot like memorize it while understanding it okay understand why it's uh, given there don't just switch off your brain and memorize it okay but uh, why is it like this at least one point at, at uh, cross sectional data you have at least one variable for at least two points of time because that if you have only one point of time then you don't have time series data because there's no series this is clear so when you understand the name that is clear that is time series so there has to be at least two data points otherwise there's no series but even two data points technically is a series although we don't normally plot for only two data points but the point is that the technical definition has to be given in a legalistic manner which means uh, that uh, you know it, it should capture all the uh, situations where that definition applies all right so technically even if i plot two data points that is also time series data today and tomorrow okay uh, time series data so uh, so is this clear to everybody now understand that there at least one variable for at least two points of time okay and that's why i said ideally multiple points of time order of observations is relevant do you see that point here can you see that the order of observations is relevant because take the last observation is 2115 and the first observation let's say is 1975 now if i change it around and i put 2115 here and 1975 here will it change the chart it will change the chart so the order of observations is i mean it's important to uh, it's relevant in the sense the order, you have to maintain the correct order of observations otherwise you're not giving the right picture of the data so we are using this expression order of observations is relevant to make a distinguish between uh, dis to distinguish between time series data and cross sectional data because in cross sectional data order of observations is not relevant this is clear and in time series this is relevant is everyone clear about why what i mean by relevant 
that you can't just in a time series in a time series data plot you can't just jumble up the order of observations because that will change the meaning of the because right now this is the truth this is the actual truth of how TCS stock has moved over this period okay <coughs> now if you just jumble up the order of observations you know you put this data into Excel then just resort the data and then plot another chart now that's not the truth anymore because that's not how the stock price moves so you have to maintain the correct order of observations is everyone clear why we make this statement that gives us a useful way to distinguish between time series and cross-sectional data this is clear okay so order of observations is relevant at least one variable for at least two periods of time okay and ideally multiple now why did I say at least one variable because if I go to compare or add symbol and I say I want to compare the movement of TCS to the movement of the nifty 50 all right now you can see this over this period the nifty 50 is uh, what this is plus or maybe it's just plus 3.25 and TCS is plus 12.95 percent this is clear so we are comparing the two we are trying to see whether the how has TCS performed relative to the broader stock market the nifty 50 is a, is being taken as an index of the broader stock market okay so the point to understand here is that although normally we plot time series data only for one variable okay but the reason I've given you the definition as at least one variable because if I give you the definition as one variable only if I don't put in that at least word in the definition if I define one variable for at least two points of time then you'll say that this is not time series data because it's not one variable it's two variables are you following my logic okay so the definition has to be always broad so that it's uh, it must always be correct okay so this would be so this is still time series data because you are just you're plotting two variables but it is still over a period of time okay this is not cross-sectional this is time series data this is clear to everyone okay are you following so basic terminology but you want to be clear there's a reason you'll you'll uh, it's very I don't think you'll find this anywhere this kind of very strict definition but this is how you should learn a subject okay that's why I've written these definitions in a strict way that when you learn it in this strict way you the concept is 100% clear in your head so you make sure you understand the concept do not memorize okay do not switch off your brain and memorize there's some element of memorization okay but you make sure you understand the uh, the concept so that you can work it back logically okay if you the, if you ever forget it all right so we want to learn some basic terminology about charts okay so there's also another term here called panel data which is a social science uh, you know which you hear in social science research okay essentially it's basically um, you know the time series data is connected it's similar to time series data but this panel data term is not used in financial markets so and we are studying financial markets charts but once again I gave you this information because I have to always tell you everything that is connected to the idea we're discussing otherwise you have a very stunted vision of the idea okay so if you one day hear what is panel data is actually similar to time series data but we use it in a social science research context not in the financial markets context okay now quickly let's go through stock concepts versus slow concepts do I have time for this I'll come back and do this later okay I'm going to write this that this is not covered because I have I'm a little panicky about the amount of uh, time I have left and um, I need to equip you with the um, skill set because your trading starts from next week is everyone clear about what they have to do uh, the responses are not convincing is everyone clear about what they have to do they have to try and buy and sell stocks generally some of the time uh, you might find that when you try to sell something you might find that uh, if you try to sell TCS you might find that um, I just hit the bid because I want to sell okay if I want to go for a market sell order maybe if I want to go for five thousand shares if I want to sell sometimes you might get a message saying that uh, doesn't matter okay the, here you don't get this message okay but sometimes you might get a message saying you, you see how it's filling the order but I think I've switched off the sound that's why you don't hear uh, this uh, message coming up but uh, it's filling the order can you see that slowly um, these position size is increasing the short position okay 
sorry this is I think uh, yeah so uh, it's filling the order now the point is that uh, sometimes you get, might get a message saying that shortable stock is not available because understand this that you can actually you don't have to first buy it to sell it okay we'll explain this in detail later but understand this as basically uh, you don't have to you can actually go short this is called short selling where you don't have to have now you sold 5000 TCS total okay you can see here you can see the breakdown here you can look at how many trades had to be done to come to 5000 okay you can see all these trades all right all these trades that have been done and you can see your total commission also all right the point is uh, okay so the point is sometimes you might get a message saying shortable stock is not available in which case you can't go short okay so the point I was trying to emphasize here is that um, the point I was trying to emphasize uh, is if you see uh, we can close the flash crash video now we can close the foreign exchange market video as well I mean this this chart okay the point I was trying to emphasize here was that I'll just remove this also all right the point is that you don't have to necessarily buy okay the point that Kurtu was mentioning yesterday that uh, the market keeps on falling okay the stock market keeps falling and so uh, whatever we are buying the stocks are positions are going into losses but if you have a bearish view on a particular stock or on the market as a whole okay in here you're trading individual stocks if you have a bearish view on the stock you should just try to sell it okay just uh, I, I mean I don't have a bearish view on TCS but I just sold it just to show you okay that you can actually start out by selling as well so we'll understand the mechanics of short selling later if you want to understand it you can there's nice uh, explanation on the interactive brokers website you can check that website is very good you can explore that website as well so uh, the point is that get this out of your mind that you have to first buy it before you would sell it you can go short as well that's just going uh, that's you know short selling okay in the stock market so you are going short so if you have a bearish view for the purposes of your project if you have a bearish view try to sell it if you find that the stock is not available for short selling okay uh, then obviously you can't do anything then you just uh, the next best thing to do is don't buy at least okay so if you have a bearish view the best thing to do is to go short but if the stock is not available for short selling we'll explain later what that means that means essentially that you can't execute the short, uh, short sale in that case the next best thing you can do is at least don't buy it stay away from that okay so if you have a bearish view on TCS you try to go short but if you can't go short at least don't buy it buy something else where you feel a little bit bullish or you at least don't feel so bearish this is clear so you have an operating rule okay now you may not understand a lot of the stuff so what will happen to you in the course of this project is that you will find that uh, you may feel like you're just being thrown into the water and you don't know how to swim okay so as I, I might have explained to you earlier that this is inevitable because of the structure of the curriculum okay uh, we don't have ideally what would happen is I would teach you all this theory in the first year and then in the second year we would do all these projects and then you can have more sophisticated discussions based on your foundational knowledge but that's not how the curriculum is structured okay so therefore uh, basically what's happening is you are learning to uh, you are just being thrown in the water it's like I'm throwing you in the water and then I'm showing you from the side I'm showing you look here is the book on swimming okay so uh, so this is basically what's happening but this is something that you have to accept so you may feel uncomfortable okay but accept this as basically we are constrained by the time that we have in the program and the overall structure of the curriculum because the material you're studying in the first year is different material is different kind of material okay so we don't have so I'm ha having to so so this is just but it, I think it's still useful if you just keep this idea in your mind what I told you okay let's try and look at uh, go for um, if you just keep this idea in your mind uh, what I told you about basically looking at it as a surfing surfing exercise okay you don't need to read a book on physics to learn how to surf okay you can just go there and take a surfboard and just teach yourself how to surf without any guidance just through your own gut feel right you can do that right in the same way think of it as surfing it's a simple approach to the market and it's actually quite a sound approach as long as you always apply your stops always put slops on every trade which means the idea must be that every trade is just a gamble and so therefore on one gamble you should not lose a huge amount of money so make sure your loss the maximum loss on any trade is limited to a reasonable amount you have a million dollars in your account you can let's say assume that you can grow up a million dollars 
so that should be you should not blow up a million dollars on one trade so you should carve it up okay and then uh, bet in small lots so that you can lose many on many trades uh, and still be able to play right is this clear okay it's like when you go into a casino and you have ten thousand dollars your plan is that okay i'm going to blow up ten thousand dollars okay but then you don't go blow up ten thousand dollars on the first bet okay so you would carve it up maybe into you know five hundred dollar lots okay and then keep betting five hundred dollars and see if you strike it uh, lucky right so the same concept applies here as i told you those artificial con concepts that you hear about uh, you know investment and speculation those are all garbage they are based on a poor understanding of life and a poor understanding of markets and economies and risk everything is speculation there's no such thing as investment as opposed to speculation everything is speculation okay so and therefore there is a there is a professional way to speculate and the professional way to speculate is this way you decide how much you're going to you're going to the casino at ten thousand dollars you're ready to lose ten thousand dollars you don't have a you're not going to have a heart attack if you lose ten thousand dollars okay so you are ready to lose it and then you go in there and you systematically carve it up into five hundred dollar lots and you keep betting and then you see what happens okay so that this is what is professional speculation so uh, everything is speculation but you have to speculate in the professional way this is clear are you getting the message so if you just approach uh, this market from a surface perspective but keeping risk management in mind it's perfectly it's a very solid and legitimate approach and it's a very simple approach so you can apply that okay so what are the things you have to do let me try because this is our last session so from from monday onwards you start trading in your live project account okay so is every team here every team is represented here okay so please then what you have to do is make sure that uh, by this weekend okay you send me an email as to which is your uh, give me the particular login id i've given you three or four login ids okay so which one which login id is going to be a project trading account okay uh, please email that to me all the team leaders or somebody from the team uh, mentioning the team leader's name should uh, email that is everyone clear about that yes. i'm not going to separately send you an email on this send me that information on which is going to be your trading account because that should be declared beforehand okay so then um, all right so what are we going to do now quickly stock concept versus flow concepts i'm going to discuss later because i don't have time not covered okay okay so i have what 12 minutes now i'm trying to just quickly see what else i have to cover all right so now guys we are plotting the uh, we are covering the other important part which we have to at least cover now i think decision problems i'll have to eventually uh, do okay let me do this here let me just at least give you a, a, a full a uh, rundown on what you're going to do okay is everyone following so far anybody confused okay so as i said you will feel that it is a little bit uh, you know rushed but life is confused light light is confused okay I'm going to come to this uh, some type of plot. Okay, let me just do candles. All right. Okay. So, all right, guys. Now this is what you're going to do. Okay, you're going to go. Let's. Uh, now this this part of the presentation is very important because I'm trying to quickly sum up for you. Okay, how you're going to approach the project. Okay, so you have the entire list of Nifty Fifty stocks. Go to the NSE website. Take out the Nifty Fifty stocks. Okay. And in uh, programming, I don't know if you guys, have, any of you guys, have ever done programming. There's a concept of repeat and repeat. Okay, so whatever logic I'm telling you for ITC as one stock, so you pick one stock, you apply this uh, process to that stock, then end that when you when that is done, then you go to the next stock and keep on repeating the same process for all the stocks. Okay, so I pick out ITC as my first stock. Okay, and then I have to form a view. Am I going to be a seller or a buyer? and that view is based on at this point of time 
it's just going to be because you can always apply i mean i don't have the time to teach you a fundamental analysis at this point of time because it's quite a body of material okay but if you are comfortable with the fundamental analysis you can always listen to the tv programs and follow the coverage of itc look at their financial statements you already have done all these financial statements in your first year okay so if you want to apply some of that type of analysis which is typically what people do when they talk about stocks so oh, itc is going to do very well because chug is going to start smoking six times a day now so you know, uh, business is going to start booming okay so do this kind of analysis okay and then you decide to buy idc okay so this is fundamental analysis okay this is what fundamental analysis is okay all right now what i have taught you is technical analysis okay which is just not worrying about you don't even know what idc sells okay you just see this thing okay this is called itc and it's going up and down and i just take a view on whether it's going up and down like a surfer okay whether it's going to go which way is it going next okay a surfer doesn't know anything about fluid mechanics it just takes a call he just takes a call on which way the wave is going to come okay so that's all you're trying that's a technical view approach which is a very simple approach but if you want to take a fundamental analysis approach you are free to do that okay so either by using technicals or fundamentals you form a view is this clear so i form a view here on itc uh, my view is that let's say it's going down all right my view is going down so now immediately what i will do is now this is a slightly longer term chart this is a daily chart uh, see how i'm approaching it then this is the purely technical approach because in fundamentals anyway you can't be so specific okay so immediately i'm going to go short all right so i need to place a stop that's my next question okay i'm trying to make it very very simple okay my first decision is basically whether i want to buy or sell because the universe of markets is decided we will study decision problems in a more formal way later on but i'm trying to really compress it here to just what you need your universe is clear nifty 50 stocks whatever i'm doing to itc you will have to go and repeat it for all the stocks in the nifty 50 same logic pick up the chart take a view i look at this my first instinct is i want to sell okay so i will and to make it very simple i'm going to sell at market okay so we'll discuss about market orders limit orders later on but i don't want to complicate that decision about the entry price i'm going to make it very simple i'm going to sell at market okay if so i'm going to sell at market but at the same time the next question then becomes so my decision to buy or sell which arora was wondering about how did i decide to buy or sell that here i just look at the chart and my instinct says sell okay and then obviously i have to set a stop so selling now i know which side of the market i am on i have to set a stop i can't see very clearly here there's a daily chart this is too uh, you know uh, the zoom is too far away i need to zoom in okay i'm going to zoom in to this part here so i can set a tight stop okay one stop i can set is market is at 270 i go short at 270 okay one stop i can set clearly is at 3 311 312 here this high okay i can set that stop but my problem is 270 to 311 that's too much for me okay i want to sell a reasonably large volume i don't want such a wide stop i can i want to see if i can get a tighter stop remember these terms yes. wide stop tighter stop so uh, one option straight away is 270 to 311 that's my stop 311 is my stop but i don't i don't want such a wide stop i want a tighter stop so that what i'm going to do is i'm going to zoom in here okay so i'm going to make this i'm going to increase the granularity now i'm using some terms which we'll cover later this is called granularity i'm increasing this what i'm going from one day to i'm going to 15 minutes so i'm increasing the granularity okay so i'm zooming in okay now you see here this this is that 311 high now i can see a lot more detail okay so extreme case what i can do now i have two better options i don't want such a such a wide stop okay i can either place my stop here <coughs> around 275 you understand which one i'm pointing at yes. either i can place it here or i can place it here okay both of them are much better than 311 okay so i think i'll just place it here okay 275 in practice what i will have to do is i'll have to read zoom out and go to roll my uh, cursor here and position it you see how the numbers are changing yeah. i read the high here the high is 275.10 are you following where my cursor is the high is actually 275.10 the system can show you the is showing you the things okay so you can take any charting software you can use money control for longer term charts so 275.10 and here they're trading in 15 minutes uh, five paisa increments so i will set my stop at 275.11 i uh, sorry 
275 15 see this high is 275 10 you see the high O is for open high H is for high can you see that 275 10 so my stop trigger is 275 15 okay okay we still have five minutes I'm going to quickly give you this uh, information okay so my what do I do say immediately I sell ITC okay I'm just going to sell hundred so that I save some time okay how much will I sell that will come to later okay immediately I sell it okay I sold it now I have to set an order um, no, I don't want to open order entry is very complicated actually um, let me just set a buy okay okay so this sell this red thing just forget about it. this already is executed the order is already executed okay now I'm putting a buy order what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my stop okay remember I have to set my stop what is the figure I read off um, 275 10 but actually I have to set it at therefore higher than 275 10 so I set it at 275 15 okay is this clear to everybody because it has to go higher than 275.10 okay now what I do is I set a buy order see that sell thing has disappeared now I want to buy order make sure it's for the same position amount I sold 100 so this buy is for 100 now this will be a stop order this will be a stop order okay this is going to be a stop order and this price the stop price this has to be edited to 275 15 is what I said okay is this clear I said a 275 15 stop order and I transmit okay assuming that um, yeah this is all kinds of warnings we'll, we'll just override and transmit okay so the order is now live because I got a green signal here okay the order is live so now you see what I've done very quickly I've moved through very some very important decisions okay first this few decisions I already made for you which asset class equities what type of instrument spot okay which markets only NSE nifty 50 no Toyota motor trading on Toyota stock Tokyo stock exchange no none of that is allowed I have made some decisions for you asset class market instrument equities uh, nifty 50 stocks instrument is spot type I made those decisions for you then you have to make the decisions about buy or sell okay you look at the ITC chart you pick out ITC as the first stock you look at the ITC chart you form a view based like a surfer you form a view that is going down okay then immediately you sell at market to make it simple okay if you wanted to sell at a better price you would have placed a limit sell order we'll come to that later but right now simply you sell at market okay and then you have to place a stop okay so your stop is at 275.15 so now what I've done is now my per per share risk is capped at 272 311 or no, not 311 where is it? 275 10, 275 15 so my per share risk is 275 15 minus 270 is that right yeah is that correct yes. is everyone following this yes. Verma? Yes, sir. okay 275 15 minus 270 is my per share risk is everyone clear assuming that the stop is executed at 275 15 itself it may end up getting executed at 275 20 or 25 okay but let's assume that it's going to get executed to so my per share risk is 275 15 to 270 okay so 515 is my per share risk okay now I come to the other important question of how much do I want to um, No, just one minute but how much do I want to sell I just give you a quick summary how much do I want to sell okay now I have one million dollars in my account okay as a thumb rule what you should do is maybe just you can start with one percent okay you don't want to risk more than one percent per trade so you need a total of hundred losing trades in a row to blow out your whole capital you take one million dollars as your capital equivalent of that and convert it into rupees is your capital okay so as a thumb rule we'll come to that discussion later on as a thumb rule you say that i will not risk more than one percent of my total capital on each trade so one percent of a million dollars converted into rupees okay see the rupee balance and then one percent of that is your per trade risk okay so now the question of how, remember this still has to be decided this is a default figure hundred 
this position size also has to be decided actively by you you don't just take the default in the system okay how will you just i'll just finish i'll just finish just give me two seconds okay we have already done this exercise once remember it's in your scalp file how will you decide this figure out what one percent of one million dollars is okay suppose the figure is x okay then divide that figure x by what is the risk i defined on this trade 5.15 i define the risk is 5.15 per share risk so how many shares to sell is that x divided by 5.15 this exercise has already been done in one of your previous classes and the calculation is in your spreadsheet have you got the logic yes you understood the logic yes. okay so one percent why one percent now you can say why one percent why not two percent we'll come to that later at the moment you just work with the one percent guidance okay mainly it's meant to be a very low figure okay that's all it means okay so is everyone clear now you have the guidance on what you have to do yes. you have all the decision rules yeah. and then you keep on repeating suppose you go short and it keeps on going down that you have one decision to take on, uh, on a daily basis you keep on maintaining the short position for as long as you feel bearish remember this is the bearish view so you keep looking at the chart all the time several times a day and so the other question that arises when should i exit my position yeah. suppose the stock you've gone short and you're making money keeps on moving down okay just repeat the same analysis when you no longer have a bearish view then you should exit your position okay we'll give you more refinement on that later on but for now you can start with this this is okay yes all right good please make sure everybody subscribes and uh, uh, gets notified pick up watch the videos make sure you internalize all this learning whatever we have covered in the class nobody should ever forget it in their lifetime is this clear should be totally embedded in your brain Okay